Okay, so we'll not waste any more time um, and get Timothy Terryberry started with his talk on video codecs. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the DALA video codec project, which is a joint project between the uh, ZIF.org Foundation and Mozilla. Um, and so if you were all at the keynote yesterday, you, you heard Evan tell us that patents are no longer a problem for free software. So great, I'm done, I, I can go home. <laughs> yeah, so not, the situation has gotten a lot better. Um, I'm not going to call Evan a liar. Um, but there are still places where these things are real problems, and codecs are one of them. So he mentioned that the, the Open Invention Network is a, a fantastic tool for free software projects to defend themselves against patent aggressors. And while it does a lot of very good things, if you go read the agreement somewhere buried deep in all of the legalese, it has this nice phrase where it points out, to the extent that any of the Linux environment components identified in this edition contain audio, still video, and or motion video codecs, such codecs shall be deemed not to constitute a Linux environment component. Which is a good example of why you should not let lawyers near English, but <laughs> also serves to illustrate that even all of these tools that we have managed to build up don't help us in this space. So why is it worth solving this problem anyways? And maybe this, yeah, just this one codec thing is, is we can just ignore that and it won't be a problem, right? We've got, the rest of the space is fine. Well, the, the problem is that encumbered codecs are a billion dollar toll tax on communications. So every cost that gets added to a codec, even if it's only a few cents, gets repeated a million fold in all multimedia software. Um, you go look at the modern cell phone, every single component of that cell phone is getting cheaper every, every year, with one exception, and that's the cost of licensing patents and licensing codecs. Um, all of this licensing is anti-competitive, right? So you hear people talk about fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing. I've had very well-respected lawyers in this field tell me they don't know what that means because it doesn't actually mean anything. <laughs> like the, the specific point of a good deal of codec patents is to create these discriminatory regimes in commodity hardware businesses. And so the idea is that you have to pay less to license the patents than your competitors because you happen to own some one of them and get, can get these cross-licensing deals. And now new people can't come into your space because the margins on these things are so razor thin that that few extra cents is all it takes to make them unprofitable and you profitable. Um, they're also an excuse for adding proprietary software to your system. So how many people here have Flash on their Linux system? Yeah, yeah there are a few hands. Um, and when you start relying on proprietary software for communications, you lose the assurances that you get for using free software on the privacy of those communications. You no longer have a system that you can look at and validate and guarantee that it isn't actually respecting your freedoms. So it speaks to that second problem that Evan has, has turned his focus to as well. Um, and so you can say, well, but we also have free software implementations of all these proprietary codecs too, right? And we can just use those and just not pay the patents, and that won't. That, nobody, nobody's gotten sued over that yet, right? The the problem is is that ignoring these licensing costs creates risks that can show up at any time, and so that works great until you actually build your business around this and you, you know, sell a few million units, and then somebody shows up with their hands out and you get this tax on success, right? And you'll see that, that companies like Skype, for example, famously used VP8 and VP7 before that to build up their, their business. And it wasn't until they got it wasn't until they got large enough to be able to absorb these licensing costs that they actually switched over to codecs like H264. But if they had not had the opportunity to use VP7 and VP8, they would never have gotten started. So Creating good codecs is a challenging problem. Um, however, we don't need many of them. So 
ideally we only really need one. Um, and the free software ecosystem is up to the challenge of making them. If you go look at the proprietary patenting codex, all the best implementations of them are already free software. Um, you may not be able to use it without going and getting a patent license from someone else, but the, the ability for the open source community and the free software community to build these things is already there. Um, the basic thing that we have to overcome are these network effects, right? So the, the primary costs to deploying codecs are not necessarily the licensing costs and all of that, but the compatibility problems with everybody else. So if we want to be able to, to build, f use free codecs in all of our products, we have to make sure that everybody else uses them also. Um, where royalty-free codecs are established, non-free codecs have never displaced them. And so some, some good examples are JPEG and PNG and FLAC. Um, there have been many different competitors that have tried to displace JPEG, and none of them have even tried to charge licensing costs. All of them have claimed to be technically better than JPEG, and they still haven't succeeded just because JPEG is so widespread. Um, this is not necessarily true for royalty-bearing codecs. Um, there have been good examples of those being displaced by royalty-free versions. Um, but being royalty-free is not enough, right? So everyone in this room hopefully cares about, about avoiding other people's IPR, but other people out there care about different things and say, yeah, I can afford to buy a codec in my business, right? What I want to get is the best quality per bit or the simplest integration into my application, right? And so you have to be good on all of these fronts. It's not enough to say, well, we're a little bit worse on quality per bit, but we're free, right? To get the kind of the network effects you need so that everybody is using these things, you really have to be better in every, in every way. So we've already done this for audio. Um, we made a, a nice codec called Opus. It was published in the IETF about two years ago, and it can single-handedly replace 10 different codecs across all sorts of applications and be better than all of them. Um, it, despite the fact that when we started and we said our goal was to make a royalty-free codec and you know, we wanted to, to cover some broad uses of applications, but you know, we were never expecting it to be quite to outperform everything, because what we had originally targeted was we're going to focus on low latency communications, they're going to make a bunch of trade-offs that make that possible, and that means stuff like high latency, music streaming, and that sort of thing, we're, we're not going to ever be able to compete on. Well, it turned out we were able to compete on that. And it wasn't until we got the quality levels that we started to beat everything that people got really interested in this codec. Um, so that sort of illustrates the effect of you really do have to be better on a whole bunch of different fronts. Um, so Opus is now the standard codec for WebRTC. Um, it's seeing lots of inroads in other places. Um, and so we really hope in the next few years that, that this will start to displace a lot of the proprietary audio codecs, which, by the way, are generally even more expensive than video. So... Hopefully, since we've succeeded in audio, we can now turn our attention to video. And so the latest generation is, is being fought between HEVC and VP9. Um, our goal is to be better than both of those without infringing HEVC's IPR. So in order to do that, we need to not only make a codec that's really good, we need to convince people that it is safe to use. And to do that, we need a better strategy than, well, we're going to go read a lot of patents. Um, the problems with that is people don't believe you when you said, I read a lot of patents, it's OK. Um, you know, we've been doing this for, I don't know, 13, 14 years for me personally, some, some of us in the Zift Order Foundation for almost 20 years now. And you would think after that point you would have earned some amount of credibility that, yes, we know how to design a codec that doesn't read on other people's patents, but when you ask somebody to actually ship your codec, they stop and think really hard for a bit. Um, and this is, you know, with, not without good reason. 
because doing the kind of analysis is to say that you know there are thousands of patents in this space and we don't infringe on any of them is really error prone, right? We try to stay f fairly far away from the line of what's permissible and what's impermissible, but a single mistake can ruin years of development. Um, and so a good example of that is actually the H.264 baseline profile, which when they started standardizing this in 2003, they said, we would like to make this royalty free. And they got a whole bunch of companies to sign agreements and saying, yes, this is going to be royalty free. We will put our patents in if everybody else does. Only they didn't get the people who, gave, who submitted the initial proposal for 264. All they got were all the people who added additions on top of that. And the people who had submitted the initial proposal said, no, we don't like that idea. And so that's now not royalty free. And there have been various attempts to make it royalty free, you know, to, to try to convince those other parties over the years. And we're now, you know, 12 years later and it's still been unsuccessful. And so all the work that people did when they thought they were making this nice free royalty free codec, you know, has been locked up behind these patents. So, our strategy is to try to look for some, some elements that are common to broad classes of patents. Um, and so I'm not going to go into a, a great detailed explanation of how you work around patents. Um, if you were in Wellington five years ago, Andrew Tridgell gave a fantastic talk on how to do just that. Um, and I all recommend you go watch the stream if you have not. Um, but to... To give a short summary, you know, every patent claim is going to have some long list of elements in it, and we only need to avoid one of those elements to be able to say, we don't do that, which is the best defense you can have to avoid a patent. And so what we're going to do is try to identify some elements that show up again and again and again in many, many different patents and replace those with fundamentally different techniques. And the idea is that we don't necessarily have to have read every patent, and we will still try to do that, but if something shows up out of the woodwork some number of years from now, there's a good chance that we won't read on it simply because our design was so far out of what they were considering when they filed the patent that it does not apply. Um, this is a generally higher risk, high reward strategy than, than the sort of incremental change approach that a lot of, of codec development has followed for the past 20 years. And so people have taken these things and you show up at a big meeting with a hundred different people proposing slightly incremental changes that each get you one and two percent improvements. And each one of those is, of course, patented by your employer. And you combine all of these things together and at the end of the day you say, well, look, our codec is 50 percent better than the previous one. And you can go to this well a few times, but eventually you're going to start to hit diminishing returns and it is getting harder and harder to find these incremental changes that improve things. So we are trying to take sort of this higher risk approach of we're going to go in some fundamental different directions and that will potentially get us out of these local minima. Um, at the same time, it'll help us avoid wide swaths of these, this IPR that other people have, have already filed. And it's sort of its own reward in the sense of it creates new challenges that other people haven't solved. You know, if I want to implement technique A, and technique A has, you know, some fundamental engineering challenges associated with it, and I go pat patent all the solutions to those challenges, and somebody else comes along and says, I'm going to implement technique B, and technique B is not like technique A, and it doesn't have the same problems associated with it. You know, this is sort of the, the there is a whole class of inventions where people say, you know, to, to state the problem is to state the solution, right? Um, and... A, a good patent lawyer has always, always trying to patent the problem rather than the solution. And by using these different techniques, we are actually trying to solve different problems. And so we avoid lots of IPR in that way as well. Um, now, all that said, we still have to read a lot of patents. Um, because you can never be certain about any of this stuff until you actually do your homework. So I said we want to we do some things that are fundamentally different. Um, so we started out by identifying about four key areas that we thought there were good, credible technological alternatives to. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these in, in more or less detail, depending on the, which one. So the first one is this idea of a displaced frame difference, which is used in motion compensation. If you don't know what that is, we're going to talk about it in a couple slides. Um, the second one is the, this idea of, of doing adaptive loop filtering, which is used to remove blocking artifacts. So if you've all seen low quality video, you've seen block edges show up at low bit rates. And this, this is one of the techniques that's used to avoid that. Um, so the next one is spatial prediction or interprediction. And the idea there is that if sometimes you have to code frames without referencing other frames. And so you want to predict, you want to predict one area of the frame from something that's nearby. Um, and finally, binary arithmetic coding, um, specifically context modeling. And this is, this is the way that the final bits get encoded into the bit stream. And we will have a different way of doing that as well. So let's talk about the displaced frame difference. So the idea behind motion compensation, as traditionally done in most codecs, is that you have some, some reference frame that you've already decoded, and you want to predict your input frame. And so what you do is you copy blocks from the already encoded frame, and they're offset by some motion vector, so you can count for things moving around the frame. And when you've copied all those blocks, you subtract them from the input, and you're left with this residual. And the residual is now much closer to zero and has lots less information in it. And, you know, there's still some errors where you weren't able to predict things very well. But the idea is that this is where a good percent of your compression comes from. Um, the displaced frame difference is the term of art for that residual. And, you know, it, in, and of, in and of itself, it's not patentable. I mean, people have been using this for 30 years. So I'm sure somebody tried to patent it 30 years ago. But at this point, you could say it's fairly well clear. But a lot of the other details of, well, how do I code those motion vectors that I'm using to copy the blocks from? And if the, if the motion vector doesn't point to an integer offset, how do I do the interpolation around that um, to, to copy those blocks? And you know, all of these details around the idea of motion compensation, there are many, many patents around them. But every single one of them, to, to a, larger, a greater or lesser degree, says, at some point, we do a subtraction, we compute this displaced frame difference, and code the residual. And we actually filed our own patent on what we're doing. And the technical writer that had been assigned by the law firm to write up the details of our patent um, added the step of subtracting <laughs> the predictor and coding the residual to our diagrams and to our claims. And we had to go explain to him, no, we're not doing that. And he, he honestly could not understand how you could have a codec that didn't do that. So I'm going to help you try to understand. <laughs> Um, so what we do instead starts with this idea called perceptual vector quantization. And this is based on work that we, we did in the Opus Audio Codec, the, with the idea behind it being to preserve energy. And so an audio preserving energy, you know, specifically refers to the kind of audio textures that you normally hear and, in, and, in, in, you know, different tones and different, uh, impulse responses and all that stuff. Um, in, f in video, it's, it means stuff like film grain and fine details, right? So we don't want to smooth everything out. Now, the way this is done is that we try to separate the energy or the gain of the information we're trying to encode from the shape, which is you know, this, how it is distributed in frequency space in the spectrum. <laughs> And so what this all really boils down to is that we have a bunch of numbers we'd like to encode, and we put them in a vector. And we take the magnitude of the vector, the length of the vector, and we code that separately from the direction the vector is pointing in, which is just some point on a large n-dimensional hypersphere. So this has a bunch of potential advantages. Um, we can give each of those two different components a different number of bits. So we have the potential to say, there's some energy here but I'm not really going to tell you where it is. And this is very hard to do in traditional approaches. Um, but that lets us you know, preserve some of the contrast of the image that we've been fed 
without low passing everything, even if we're throwing away some information in the process. Um, we also get this idea of activity masking for free. And so what activity masking tries to do is it says, well, we have these regions of high contrast. We can throw away more information than we would be able to otherwise before you notice. And because the relative error that we're th of the, the, you know, the inaccuracies that we're introducing by doing that is smaller because the numbers are, that we're starting off with are bigger, right? And so the, the thing you need to know to know how much you can throw away is exactly this gain, this energy, which tells you how much contrast there is. And so other codecs, when they try to make these kinds of adaptive decisions of how much stuff to throw away, they have to signal that separately in some other bits. And we don't have to signal anything separately. We get it for free. Um, it also winds up being just overall a better representation of these coefficients. And so if you, you think of things like a fade to black, you can see how having a single number that represents the magnitude of the information you have, you know, fits that kind of, of change much more easily, right? I can just make that number smaller and the whole thing fades. Whereas if I were coding each of those numbers independently, I'd have to change everything, every frame. So what does all of that have to do with splice frame differences? The problem is, is that if I subtract my predictor and code a residual, I've lost this idea of the energy. You know, the energy of my residual is completely unrelated to the energy of my original signal. So all of the advantages I got disappear. But we really want to do prediction, right? As I said, this is where most of the, the compression benefit comes from, because they do a great job of reducing the amount of information we need to code. So what are we going to do? Well, you step back and look at, say, what is this prediction actually doing? What it's really doing is changing the probability of points near the predictor. Right? So I'm not going to go into Shannon's entropy theorem and all that stuff with you. If you haven't seen it before, go read Wikipedia. But the, the gist of it is highly probable things are cheap to code. And if you're computing a displaced frame difference, what highly probable means is near zero. So after I've done the subtraction, most of my stuff is pretty close to zero. And so I can do a very simple model. If it's, if it's near zero, I'll use very few bits. And if it's far away from zero, I'll use lots of bits. And that's what gives me my compression. So we can do the same thing already with, with these gains, right? They're just single numbers. And so I can subtract. I can compute the gain of my predictor. And I can compute the gain of the, the pixels I'm trying to encode and subtract those. And now I have a number near zero. And that's, that's very easy to fit into the same framework. And this is OK, because we're not subtracting pixels anymore. We're subtracting the lengths of these vectors, which is something very different in terms of patent law, right? These details matter. But then I have the shape to deal with. And it turns out that enumerating points on a sphere near some other arbitrary point is really a hard problem. Because now, I, you know, how, do I, how do I represent in the codec that the points over here are more probable? Um, we actually tried to do this with Opus, and we spent I don't know, almost five years toying around with different approaches to it, and it never really worked very well. And eventually, after we finished Opus, sadly, we came up with the idea that we could just transform the space to single out points near the predictor. And you're all thinking, well, of course, that's exactly what you do. <laughs> and it winds up looking a lot simpler than it sounds. So let's go through a simple example. So imagine I have this 2D projection of my n-dimensional hypersphere, and I have this input vector, right? And I've normalized this out so that I'm, we're not talking about the gains here. We're just talking about the shapes, which just means the direction of the vector is the only thing that's important. And so I also have this predictor. And the decoder knows what the predictor is, because it's going to compute it the same way that the encoder knows it. So I don't have to code anything extra to, to tell the decoder what that is. And now I'm going to compute a, what's called a householder reflection that maps the predictor onto one of these axes. And if you don't know what a householder reflection is, that's something else you can go look up on Wikipedia. But the basic idea is it's just a reflection plane 
that takes an arbitrary vector and maps it to some axis. And so all of the numbers in the vector are now zero, except for one of them, which is one. And this makes it very simple to deal with. And so in order to deal with this, what we're going to do is compute and code an angle between the input and the prediction. And that angle is now what represents how close you are to the predictor. And so we can model the probabilities of that instead of trying to model the probabilities of all these individual points on the sphere. And then we code the other dimensions somehow, and I'm not going to go into details of that somehow. But the point is, is that you've taken this n-dimensional hypersphere, and you've picked out this one direction, and now I've, I've coded this angle to say how close to this predictor I am, and I'm left with this n minus one dimensional hypersphere, which you can kind of see in 3D project in there. And so I've just reduced my problem by one dimension. And so this, this new parameter theta, this angle, is actually somewhat intuitive, as it says, how much like the predictor are we? You know, when we started out, we had n different numbers that you know, were all unrelated. That we, You couldn't really point to any one of them and say, what does this number mean, right? But now we've got two numbers that are actually relatively intuitive parameters. One of them tells me how much contrast I have. The other one tells me how close to my predictor I am. And you can start to do intuitive things with this. Um, you know, f f with, when theta equals 0, that means use this predictor exactly, right? And so things near zero are highly probable. I expect my predictor to be good. That should be cheap to code. And that's where all of this, this probability modeling of points near the predictor should be cheap to code is, is grouped into this one parameter theta. Um, the remaining n minus one dimensions we code using vector quantization. And so if, if you attended my, my talk in 2009 on, on KELT, how many people were in Hobart? <laughs> Yeah, so I'll refer you to that presentation on how all of that works. Um, but the basic idea is that we know the magnitude of that vector that we're coding is, is the gain times the sine of theta. And so we can use that extra piece of information to remove one degree of freedom and save some, save some bits by using vector quantization to code it. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're doing now is instead of subtracting my predictor from my input pixels, which is essentially, if you think of these as two vectors doing a translation, what we're really doing is scaling the vectors and then applying a reflection. And whatever else you can say about anything that I just explained, this is nothing like computing a displaced frame difference. And the good part is that this works. <laughs> which is, you know, was surprising to us too. <laughs> Um, so the graph on the left there is showing the peak signal to noise ratio of using perceptual vector quantization versus scalar quantization, which is what basically you quantize each, each number individually, and that's what most traditional codecs do. Um, in this case, we're not actually turning on activity masking, and the reason for that is because activity masking makes PSNR worse, because PSNR is a terrible, terrible metric, but everybody uses it. <laughs> um, but we also look at various different perceptual metrics, one of them which is called fast SSIM, and this is sort of less accepted in the video coding industry, but we find it does a good job of telling you, for example, how much texture you preserve in your original image, which is what activity masking is supposed to do. And so we turn activity masking on, we get that second curve over there, which shows that we are in fact doing much better. And also we look at images and videos that we've encoded, and they look better too, which is a nice thing to double check sometimes. <laughs> so that's the displaced frame difference. Um, there are, as I said, several other differences. So one is this idea of loop filters. You know, the loop filters are a filter that you run across the edges of two different blocks to try to remove these blocking artifacts. And they are adaptive, right? So the idea is that the filter, the strength of that filter depends upon the amount of difference across those edges. So if you have some large difference, then that's probably caused by something that was actually different in the image you were trying to code. While if you have a relatively small difference, that's probably just noise that you added because you threw away a bunch of information when you coded it. And so you want to apply a stronger filter there to get things smoother. Um, 
they're also not invertible in the sense of after you've applied this filter, there's no way to undo it. Um, and so these filters have been used for a long time, including all the way back to H.263 and in our own codec Fiora, but they were very primitive and didn't actually work very well because they were trying to be extremely cheap on CPU because when these codecs were designed, you know, 15, 20 years ago, CPUs were not nearly as good as they are now. So as CPUs got better, people designed more complex filters, and there's been an explosion of, of these filters, which work much better than the previous ones do, but also have lots more patents on it. And since those patents are all less than 20 years old, we said we would like to avoid that whole mess. And so what we do instead are use these things called lap transforms. And the idea of lap transforms is that we have one of these filters that runs between these block edges, just like the, the adaptive filters, but it's non-adaptive and it's invertible, which means I can run it forwards, I can run it backwards, and get the thing back that I started with. And so what being invertible means is that I can run the inverse in the encoder as a pre-filter, and now I don't need it to be adaptive, because I don't have to worry about, well, there was really you know, some difference there that, that I shouldn't destroy with this filter, because I inverted it already, and so it's in the encoder side, and so I'm, there's nothing to destroy anymore, right? This is not losing information the way that these, the loop filter loses information. Um, the techniques date back to the mid-90s, which is just about perfect for us. Um, there are some patents in this space, but there are vastly fewer of them, and vastly, they're all much older than the loop filter patents. And so it's a lot easier for us to go through and analyze these things and figure out whether or not this is okay. And we've had people come up to us and say, oh, but there are patents on those things, you can't use that. And we say, you know, you go, go look. And they come back to us later and say, oh, yeah, okay, that's fine. And that makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> um, but the idea of this pre-filter is that what it's really doing is taking your image and making it blocky. Right? And so this is this actually winds up helping compression in the sense of these these discontinuities across these block boundaries are essentially free to code, right? When you're coding things a block at a time, it doesn't matter what, that there's a difference there. Um, and so we are taking advantage of that, that extra freedom by making things more blocky in the encoder so that on the decoder side, we can undo all of that and get a blocking-free image that has taken advantage of the fact that we could code blocks in the interior. Um, so one of the problems is that once we start using lap transforms, this problem becomes harder. And so this tool is called said, spatial or interprediction, and the idea is that you want to predict some block from the neighbors nearby that you have already coded. And so the way this normally works is you explicitly code a direction that says, I'm going to copy some of my neighboring pixels along this direction, and then just extend that boundary into the current block along that direction just by copying whatever pixels are, around, are in, near your neighbors, right? Well, that doesn't work with lapping because we can't pop, copy the pixels until we undo the lapping, but we can't undo the lapping until we've copied the pixels. <laughs> so what we do instead is we don't copy pixels, we copy transform coefficients. Um, and we spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out how to do this and still copy things in these arbitrary diagonal directions. And there's a lot of fun math you can do that, to try to, to solve that problem. And ultimately, we couldn't make any of it work very well. We could make it work fine if you had infinite CPU, but few people have that. Um, so currently what we're doing is something that is much simpler. Um, we just copy things in the horizontal and vertical direction. and for the chromoplanes, which is the color information, we copy that from the, the black and white luma information, um, which basically means we don't have to care about coding a direction for it, because what we're trying to say is that you know, the boundaries of different colored objects is, are in the same place as the 
boundaries in black and white objects that are, you know that they're representing when you split up the signal that way. Um, so all of this prediction is not as good as copying pixels around, but we make up for it in other places. In particular, the lap transforms give us a, an improved coding performance. You know that we give some back when we do this interprediction in a slightly less optimal way. Um, finally, there's binary arithmetic coding. So arithmetic coding is the thing that you use to actually generate a number of bits based on the probability of some symbol you're encoding. So this is what gives you the things that things that are higher probability or cheaper to code is because you run them through this process. Um, so what traditional video codecs do is they only code binary decisions. So it's very cheap to code one symbol because um, you only have to consider like am I coding a zero or am I coding a one and you wind up using different numbers of bits to signal zero or one depending on the probabilities but it's very easy to make those decisions. Um, however to code an entire video frame you need to code lots of symbols and this is an inherently serializable process so you can't parallelize any of this and this actually winds up being one of the bottlenecks in hardware implementations of modern codecs is you need a clock cycle high enough to run the thing through your entropy coder, through your arithmetic coder, um, to code all of these symbols. Um, so the idea of arithmetic coding, in particular binary arithmetic coding, is not in itself patentable anymore. The original IBM patents from 1979 are all expired. But the things of doing probability modeling, so when you have binary arithmetic coding, you can do this with a one-byte lookup table. Um, the, the ideas of taking these non-binary values that you want to encode and chopping them up until they're, until they're individual binary decisions, that is also highly patented. And so that's all of the stuff that we would like to avoid. And while it turns out the original definition of, of arithmetic coding was not restricted to coding binary decisions, so we'll just remove that restriction. Um, so we code values with up to 16 different possibilities, which, if you think about it, means it's equivalent to coding up to four different binary decisions all simultaneously. Um, it's slightly more expensive than doing things the binary way, but it's not four times more expensive, because a lot of the computational overheads of running this arithmetic coder are per simple you encode and not per the number of, of bits you're running through, the number of bits that come out the other end. Um, so what that effectively does is it gives us four-way parallelism, which is good when you're trying to make these kinds of hardware implementations that need a clock cycle that can now be potentially four times smaller, which means less power. Um, now, we can't do probability modeling the same way because we can't model 16 different probabilities with one byte. Um, we, maybe we could, but it wouldn't be very informative. Um, so instead, we use things like I'm going to assume that the distribution of my 16 points are roughly a Laplacian distribution or an exponential distribution, and then I will use one value, the expected value, or the average value of, of, those, of those points, to model the whole distribution. Um, and so that keeps the amount of state we need to store relatively small. We have to do a little bit of extra computation there to compute the individual probabilities given that shape of that distribution, but this stuff is not too expensive. Um, the other nice thing is that we're not doing this binarization, we're not converting things into individual binary decisions, we're converting them into hex. And so all the codec patents around converting things to individual, converting large numbers into individual binary decisions is basically doesn't apply because we're doing something different. Um, we also often will take a bunch of binary decisions that would have been coded you know, one at a time with a binary arithmetic coder and we're all grouping them into one symbol, right? And so this is, that is where we get some of our parallelism. But people who are doing binary arithmetic coding don't do that at all. So there are many more differences between, the, between our codecs and what traditional codecs do. I don't have time to go through all of them. But I do want to give you a brief summary of how we're doing so far. So this project is not done. Um, we still have at least a year of development left. But currently, um, using one of our perceptual metrics, PSNR HVSM, which is 
HVS stands for Human Visual System, so this is something that tries to be a little bit smarter than PSNR. Um, run over 19 different sequences. The red curve there is us. Um, the other two curves are X264 and X265. Um, and so you can see that above bit rates of about a half a bit per pixel, we're actually already winning, according to this metric, right? So this particular metric we find generally tells you how good you do um, on coding clean edges. Um, we have an, another metric that I mentioned earlier called FASSSIM, which tells you how good a job you do preserving textures. And because we have these features like activity masking built in, we do a fantastic job there. And you can see we're actually winning at almost all rates. Um, the curious thing here is that if you look at the blue and green curves, you can actually see the relative position of X264 and X265 flip between these two metrics. Um, one of the reasons for that is because the, the X264 developers spent a lot of effort trying to preserve things like film noise and, and preserve energy, you know, given the tools that their codec had. And so they're actually currently doing a better job of that than the X265 people. Um, that I expect will change as, as 265 becomes more mature, but it's an interesting observation. Um, so we have a website called Are We Compressed Yet, where we will actually run all of these metrics on any Git commit. Um, if you want to go hack on our repository, we will add your personal Git repository, and you can run them on these things. This is all run off of, of a Node.js server running on, on AWS. Um, so you get results back in a few minutes. Um, we got some nice details on that. So this was all put together by one of our interns this summer. And if you would like more information about how DALA works, we have lots and lots of demo pages giving technical details. Um, so some of this is a little bit outdated. For example, our, that, that part two there on frequency domain inter interprediction, as I said, we eventually decided all that stuff really didn't work. Um, but the, certainly the ones near the end um, are actually relevant to the current design. Um, and since I work for a browser company, if I can actually get... We actually have the entire codec implemented in JavaScript <laughs> that runs in, you know, using Inscripten. So this is decoding in JavaScript. Um, we haven't done any special optimization for this, and you can see it doesn't quite get 24, 24 frames per second on this laptop, but we have a lot of work that we can do to make this thing go faster, and we also have uh, new developments in the browser coming like SIMD and JS, which will make let us use SIMD operations to accelerate this kind of stuff. But you know, this is something that you can go to visit that URL at the top there um, and run this yourself in your own browser. So that's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, they'll, they'll go around with microphones that saves me from having to repeat the question, which I forget to do all the time. So um, what I do work at Google, I don't know actually much about what we're doing with Codex, except for WebM and VP9. Um, so I was curious, obviously your codex is supposed to be better than the existing one, so that's one reason why you're doing this. On the part where it's free and patent-wise, is VP9 WebM an issue as far as you're concerned, or is it just that you wanted to do something new? Well, and also, has Google offered to help you guys if you are better? Because after all, I think Google just wants a free codec too. Right, so yes, so Google does want free codecs. Um, so VP9, for VP9, their development strategy has been very much the traditional incremental one. Like they, were, right. they did a bunch of incremental improvements over VP8. Um, so we at Mozilla don't have an issue with believing that that stuff is royalty free. But the problem is, is that the rest of the world is not so sure, um, given that there were lawsuits against VP8 in Germany, um, all of which, you know, as far as I could tell, were completely bunk. Um, but that's the sort of thing that gives people pause. And this is what I mean by, you know, you, you, not, you not only have to do all of the work to make sure that you're royalty free, you have to convince yeah, other people. Yeah, you explained people, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? So I get that part. And then you're also hoping to be better. Why? Right hopefully being more trustworthy for people. Yeah, so, 
Yeah, so my understanding is that Google has started work on VP10. Um, we have been talking about them on trying to collaborate in the IETF to come up with some kind of joint standard, and I'm hopeful that that will, that will you know, come into, you know, as, get started as a project sometime in the next month or so. Um, so certainly there's a lot of interesting stuff that they do in VP9 and, you know, that they have on the table for VP10 that we would like to be able to use. Um, so I ho look forward to seeing contributions from them for that. Okay. And is there something they sound interesting in putting into Chrome, Android, and all that, uh, all those platforms? Or you haven't had the time to talk to them for that yet? Um, sorry, put what into Were they interested in adding your codec in uh, Android, uh, Chrome browser, and all that stuff? Or well, not? yeah. So we'll be interested in that when it's done. Right, right? you're not so, there yet. Fair enough. You know, there, there isn't a lot of point of getting it shipped in all these places until people can actually use it, um, you know, in the sense of we change it, you know, every day. So. Right. Something deployed in JavaScript like this makes some amount of sense because you know at least you're the one shipping the codec and you can make sure that it'll always mm. work. But since, you know until we do that, until we have a stable version, it doesn't make sense to put it natively into the browser. Right, okay, thank you. You mentioned something about uh, hardware implementations. So do you have already some sort of beta version hardware implementation for this? And do you have something like, like power envelope estimates on how it compares with the existing ones? Right, so we have not built our own hardware implementation. Um, we have paid a lot of attention to the hardware design to make sure that doing such a thing is feasible and you know, will fit into a reasonable amount of complexity. Um, so. You know, we've, we've prototyped some things. Um, we had someone show up and basically, you know, implement the transform stages um, on an FPGA and start to do some of that stuff for us. Uh, we do not have a complete codec implementation. And we're probably not likely to produce one ourselves just for reasons of resourcing. Um, if someone wants to show up and make one, that'd be great. All right. Um, this work is all really interesting. Um, who pays for it? Um, so the bulk of our the core developers are funded by Mozilla. Um, so we have a team of about six people right now um, with, in one manager, and we still we also have you know a various group of volunteers who contribute things as well, like the hardware implementation. I you know the hardware implementation of the transforms I mentioned was done by a volunteer. Um, we since hired him. Right. And um, you mentioned the Opus audio codec, yes. um, which I haven't much experience with, but it looked quite impressive, except at the very low bit rate end. But um, I was just wondering whether the work you're doing on DALA is going to feed back into a new, improved um, audio codec in the future. Right. So. Honestly, at this point, I think Opus is done. Um, you know, it took a lot of effort to go through and get a standard through the IETF, and so I don't think we're going to go back and revise that. There is still opportunity to write better Opus encoders to help think, bring up that performance at the low end, but if you actually look at the graph there, if I can find my mouse. You know, that's at around 8 kilobits per second. Um, you're talking on the internet with RTP on top of UDP on top of TCP, on top of, of TCP, sorry, RTP on top of UDP on top of IP. Um, you're talking about 40 bytes of headers on 50 packets a second, which is another 16 kilobits per second. So at that point, you're spending twice as many bits on network headers as you are on the actual audio. <laughs> So we weren't really worried about that small dip at that end of the curve. Uh, GSM or cellular uh, area, the ANR codecs are still very important down in low bit rate space. So I was wondering whether that was good. Yes, but GSM is dominated by people who are very, very interested in selling patented codecs. And so I think, suspect we will not. If we get into GSM, it will be because be because of the network effects of everybody else using Opus, not because they want to use Opus.
Uh, yeah, just about that, I think uh, SwitchBP is coming with a new high bandwidth codec because I don't want to use Opus. So I think that kind of answers the question. Uh, even SwitchBP doesn't really care about low bit rights anymore, and they are not going to use Opus. Probably what they're going to have is going to be worse, but they want to have patents. So. Okay, we don't have any other questions. We do have a bit more time for some. Okay, then I can thank our speaker. Yes, uh, thank you. All. And of course, you too get a gift from Linux Australia. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You're welcome.